So, as promised, here he is, the man of the hour, Cubs general manager, Carter Hawkins. Carter, thanks so much for taking time out. We know you're a busy man. Your schedule, it's uh, chock full, top to bottom. So, we're going to get digging in here. So, when it comes to you being in your first year, first year with the draft, first half of the season in the books, how have all those firsts gone so far? Yeah, it's been a little bit of uh, drinking from a fire hose, okay. for sure. And then certainly, you know, in this situation, this month, it's you know out of the frying pan, right into the fire, going from the draft to the trade deadline. But... You know, couldn't have had more fun over the course of the last several months. Obviously, we've had our challenges mm -hmm. at the major league level, but, you know, just a lot of great people and really just learning the organization and digging in. It's been a really fun experience and just excited about making everything better. You and the family enjoying Chicago in the summertime, uh, one yeah. of the best cities in all of the universe. Yeah, we're just right down the road on okay. the Southport Corridor, and we love it. My kids love it. We got three kids under three years old right okay. now, so we're, uh, we are – maxing out the stroller world these okay. days, but having a great time. Yeah, hands are full on the home front as well as in the front office. And uh, you talked about it, the trade deadline, it's right around the corner, so let's not beat around the bush. Obviously, August 2nd, and uh, one of the big centerpieces when it comes to some of those moves that could potentially be made, obviously Wilson Contreras. He avoided arbitration, came to terms on a deal north of $9 million. But on August 3rd, I think all the Cubs fans out there want to know, will he be a Chicago Cub? Yeah, we couldn't say one way or the other, obviously, more from a specific standpoint. But, you know, obviously that's a decision that we're going to be making over the course of the next few days and weeks. You know, obviously it's one that's been a conversation over the course of the entire mm -hmm. year. You know, we love Wilson. Sure. Wilson loves us. You know, he wants to be here for a long time. We'd love to have him here for a long time. we got to figure out what's best for the Cubs in the short term and in the long term mm -hmm. um, and make that decision. It might be a hard decision. It might not be. Uh, but it's something that we're digging into every single day. Yeah, he said that being a Chicago Cub is his top priority. And, of course, trying to make him a Chicago Cub for the foreseeable future, that's a top priority of the front office. But if he does have to go elsewhere, is there a potential that he could be re-signed once again? Because we know that his heart is here in the Windy City. Yeah, I think we would never rule out any player, especially a player that's as important to this franchise and to the Cubs as, as Wilson has been. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, obviously nothing set in stone on – the next week or this off season, but you know, I think it's very safe to say we like Wilson in a Cubs uniform and would love to figure out ways to make that happen short and long term. Okay, you know, Wilson Contreras is not the only person that a lot of people like seeing in a Cubs uniform. There's also some centerpieces from that 2016 World Series championship. Of course, Kyle Hendricks, Jason Hayward, and then when it comes to productive players, you also want to throw Ian Happ in that mix. Clearly not a member of that World Series team, but either way, certainly a big part when it comes to August 2nd and that trade deadline. Are we going to see any movement with any of those guys i know that's a subject that you want to keep close to the vest but cubs fans they want to know carter i think we're in a position right now where we can't eliminate any possibility okay. you know we again talked about making hard decisions jed obviously made some really difficult mm -hmm. decisions last year you know at the trade deadline and you know certainly are excited about the players that we brought into the organization as a result of that and we have to weigh is that something that we want to do again here at this position obviously some of these guys have more control than others that changes the equation a little bit there but you know, right now we're really excited about the young players we have in our system. The opportunity to add to that is obviously something that's very interesting for us. You know, we're looking at the Cubs teams of the future and the Cubs teams of the present at the same time and trying to balance how to be most competitive long-term and short-term. And it makes for some really difficult calls, but ones that we're going to have to make here in the next week. Okay, well, remaining flexible, that's something that you always want to keep on the front burner. And when flexibility comes into the discussion, you take a look at Nico Horner and some of the needs with this team moving forward. I think he's kind of closed that window, maybe just a little bit, if I'm correct in that assumption, that when it comes to needing that big-time shortstop, Nico Horner, he could be maturing and evolving into that guy. Yeah, I mean, taking aside all the other players in the league, just looking at Nico and saying, hey, has this guy established himself mm -hmm. as an everyday shortstop in the major leagues? I think he certainly has. Yeah. You know, from a defensive standpoint, he's been outstanding. Offensively, he's been great. You know, he, he's a bat that high, high contact, but he's also hit for some power and had a little bit more damage this year. So we could not be more encouraged on the field and then off the field. Yeah. And I think he really embodies everything that we're looking for, you know, in that clubhouse in terms of a guy that comes every single day plays his tails off, tails off, works his tail off. You know, he's a great example for all those guys and a great leader in that clubhouse. Another guy who's proved his weight on this team so far this year, it's the first time All-Star, of course, Ian Happ. And when it comes to his potential and what he brings to the table with this team, his leadership role, I mean, it's been next level, Carter. Yeah, I mean, to see him with the first All-Star selection, you know, to see him walk in the red carpet, yeah. you know, down in L.A., I mean, I think – you know, one thing that I haven't been able to experience with him, but the guys in the organization have been here longer, is just, you know, some of the ups and downs of his career and to see that just determination and that grit to get to where he is right now and just seeing those consistent at-bats from the right side and yeah. the left side 
and the play in left field. I mean, it's, it's been really fun for us to watch. So really excited about that with Ian and could not be happier for him. Yeah. How is the consistency of him being in left field every single day, knowing that when he comes to the ballpark, he has that peace of mind. Okay, I'm not going to be here. I'm not going to be there. I'm going to be in left field. How much has that contributed to his success in the batter's box? I think it helps. I mean, I think yeah. on one end, obviously, guys love being able to come in and say, I want to be in the same place every day and that comfort, mm-hmm. that routine. We all feel that in our normal lives. I think at the same time, you look at a lot of teams have had a lot of success in moving different players around different positions, creating flexibility at their lineups, giving them a little bit more advantage in platoon areas. Obviously, with Ian being a, a switch hitter, he's able to get in every day and, yeah. and play that well every day. So I think those are things that we're always factoring in is, you know, that comfort versus that flexibility with our lineups. But it's been easy with Ian. He's been the best shot for us in left field every day. Absolutely. Now, you just said you had your hands full, of course, with your first draft as a general manager. And the draft, as we know, it came and went. And you guys had the seventh selection overall. And you went with Cade Horton out of OU. That's Oklahoma University. Uh, Jim Callis of MLB Pipeline, senior writer, said that he was the best pitcher available in the draft at that point. Why did he turn your head? Yeah, he's a really interesting case. So he's 20 years old was a quarterback in college, so, you know, has that athleticism already. Had Tommy John surgery last year, only had 55-ish innings this year. Wasn't a guy that was necessarily performing extremely well early in the season. Mm -hmm. As he got later into the season, a little bit further away from his Tommy John, velocity started creeping up. He added a slider that turned into a wipeout pitch. By the end of the year in the College World Series, he was dominating teams, just dominating. You know, had an unbelievable outing against Ole Miss in the College World Series. And you can see with this guy, hey, like this guy has the potential to be a starting pitcher for a long time in the major leagues. Now, not as much track record as some other guys, sure. so it's a little bit more of a, of a variance in outcomes. But knowing the type of person he is, the type of athlete he is, and then what he's able to do on a high, high stage, it was a pretty encouraging pick for us. We're glad to have him in our system. Yeah, you have to be elated because eight of the top ten draft picks have been signed today. Jackson Ferris, the number two selection by you guys, 47th overall. He's not one of them. A left-handed pitcher out of IMG Academy has a lot of pop on that fastball. So what was it about you that intrigued you about him? Yeah, so a left-handed high school pitcher. He's from Mount Airy, North Carolina, okay. which I believe is actually what they based – Mayberry, North Carolina, off of in uh, the Andy Griffith, Andy Griffith show. show so okay. He is not from a large town. Chicago will probably oh, be the biggest city different. that he'll ever, yeah. ever be in. But he went down to IMG Academy in Florida um, to play, to be, have a little bit better competition in high school, which meant that he p- pitched against a lot of great bats um, and just showed his ability to compete at that level, showed some just grit and tenacity in how he goes about things every day, but also has four major league quality pitches. There's some things we're going to need to do with his delivery, with his body that you'd have to do with any 18-year-old. Um, but he's a guy that's been high on draft boards for a long time, and we're really excited to have him in our system as well. Okay, something tells me you're also really excited about the future when it comes to pitching because 16 of the 20 picks you invested in arms. Is that something that you're really locked down on, making sure that the rotation, the bullpen, everything is shored up? Yeah, I mean, I think as, as you think about the state of the game right now, there's sure. a premium on pitching. Um, there's a premium on pitching. You see it in free agency. There's a premium on pitching. You see it in players that are available mm-hmm. in trades. And so from our standpoint, it's thinking about, okay, how can we, if there's premiums in all these other areas, where else can we acquire it uh, to continue to just Mm -hmm. build our our stable up? And the draft is a great place to do that. And so that premium was reflected in the way that we valued our players going into the draft. It didn't have a specific plan to say, hey, we're going to pick 16 pitchers in these 20 picks. But the way our board fell out, it put us in a place to get a lot of arms. Okay. feel really good about the infrastructure that we have. You're seeing... You know, guys like Ewan last night, guys like Hughes, yeah. guys coming up that have started coming through that infrastructure that really started to be put in place a couple of years ago. And we're excited to put more guys into that pipeline and have more guys debut up here. Okay, when it comes to seeing and knowing quality pitchers, uh, as a former Vanderbilt University Commodore, you know what it's like to be back there behind the dish. Do you feel that gives you a more keen of an eye when it comes to scouting some of those arms? I'd love to say it. Um, I think if you look Just at my stats, yes, come on. if you look at my stats, I wasn't I wasn't playing in actual games that often. I caught a ton of bullpens okay. from a lot of first rounders when they so. were getting their work in. Exactly, Absolutely. which you know you could say is the most okay. important time, right, right. Cole? Um, but no, I, I mean I think the fact that I got to watch a ton of mm-hmm. baseball, both at Vandy those four years and then in Cleveland and for 14 years, and talked to a lot of great baseball people, that's really helped me and just my understanding of what it takes to be a great major leaguer. I'm still nowhere near where I need to be. Um, but feel like we can get better every day and help 
these pitchers and these position players get better every day as well. Absolutely. Like we said, 16 of the 20 selections, uh, they were pitchers. And when it comes to young pitching, we've seen Keegan Thompson and Justin Steele and their emergence in 2022. These guys have really shouldered a whole bunch of the load. How big have they been for David Ross and the Cubs front office this season? Yeah, that's been great. I mean, Keegan's been our stopper in some ways, yeah. you know, and, and just in terms of, of getting us out of some of these losing streaks that we've had. And then Justin has continued to battle and put out great outings, you know, and miss a whole lot of bats from the left side. Sure. So really encouraging to have two young starting pitchers and be able to carry that workload. You, know, you look back to where Keegan was last year and juxtapose that to where he is this mm -hmm. year. He's holding his stuff better, he's commanding his stuff better, and his stuff has ticked up. Kind of same thing with Justin. So you know, really encouraging. We just need to continue to develop more guys like that because you can see the impact that has on the team, both from allowing your offense to perform a little bit more easily and then also allowing you to leverage your, le your relievers in a great place. So I'm um, excited about those guys. and. It'll continue to get more up here, I hope. Yeah, it's all about the guys developing currently in the system as well as the addition of potential other players. And we know that Jed, the president of baseball operations, said that I know the money will be there at the right time. So plain and simple, Carter, when will be the right time for this Cubs franchise to go out there and spend to build that next great Cubs team? I think it's getting closer and closer every year. Yeah. I mean, this offseason, I think there was maybe four or five teams that spent more on their 2022 payroll mm -hmm. than us. Um, but we were up there in terms of just adding to our 2022 team. That said, right, we started from a little bit of a lower base. I think we're continuing to build that base up. We'll continue to add to that payroll um, and hopefully put us in a place to, to be more competitive this year. You know, we had that hope going into this mm -hmm. year. Felt like we were a team that if, you know, we had been able to stay healthy, that we had overperformed a little bit, that we'd be in a place to be adding at the trade deadline right now. Candidly, obviously, that has not happened, right? We haven't stayed healthy. We mm -hmm. haven't over overperformed. We're working every single day to figure out how we can, how we can stay healthy, how we can get our guys to, to do the things that we know that they can do and they know that they can do. Um, and hopefully that'll fall our way a little bit better next year. But we'll have the opportunity to spend this off season and, and certainly we'll be doing so. Uh, with the idea to, to be more competitive and continue to put ourselves in positions for playoff baseball here. Yeah, you look to build that competitive edge last season by spending Marcus Stroman and Seiya Suzuki, clear-cut big-time additions. But when it comes to adding more players and winning pieces of the puzzle, does this team have to be at contender status to add, or are you always looking to build and get better? Because there's at least two players out there right now who will they change the tides of a team, uh, Juan Soto and Aaron Judge. How in will the Cubs be on that sweepstakes? I think anybody could look at those two guys and say, hey, like, I would love to have them in our uniform. And yeah. that's just, I think, a general baseball statement. I mean, there's some, you know, generational type talents. You know, as we're making these decisions about how to make our current team better, we always are going to want to think about mm -hmm. how that's going to affect our future teams. Um, and, you know, it's a sliding scale there. And um, it's something that we'll have to think through on all those players. But I can safely say there's no player that we're not going to at least look into and make sure that we understand what the price is, understand what that cost is on future teams. Um, or additions to future teams. Um, and so we're excited to go through that process. There'll be a lot of different players that we'll be looking into this offseason because you know, we owe it to Chicago to, to continue to put competitive teams out there, and that's something that we're going to want to do and something that we take really seriously. Carter, when it comes to that window of opportunity and the Cubs hoisting another commissioner's trophy, oh, where is the perfect sweet spot? Is it next season, 2023? Is it 2025, or is it beyond? In terms of you know, knowing when that's going to happen, you know, who knows? You, know, you pull up fan graphs and say, all right, like, what are the World Series odds for, okay. for any of these teams, right? And the very best teams in the league, it's 10%, you know, 15%. Um, so it's hard. It's really hard to do what the Cubs did in 2016. I know. I finished second, yeah. right? So, um, you know, it's certainly hard to predict. What we can predict, though, in terms of you know, more certainty is that we have a really good young crop of players that are starting to come up through our system. They're going to start impacting our major league team. We have a great ownership group that's going to help us build around that as those guys come up. We can't dictate their timelines, mm -hmm. but we're going to push to make that as quick as possible without taking away from their ability to develop and really reach their potentials. So we know that when those things start to come together, we're going to have the resources to put together to give us that chance to be one of those top teams that have the best odds of winning a World Series. And Having another one of those parades I keep on seeing pictures of yeah. when I walk through the office. Absolutely. Now, some of those resources towards the future, clearly down on the farm as it currently stands, Pete Crow Armstrong, Caleb Killian, Alexander Canario, a lot of guys with a lot of upside. You have to feel a whole lot of promise when you look and see some of those minor league numbers. No doubt. I mean, you look at a, a Pete Crow Armstrong, you know, you see him in the futures game, you oh, yeah. see him adding a little bit of power to his game. You see him ranging 100 yards across the outfield and center field. I'm yeah. sure 
you've seen some of those plays that he's been making. So, you know, I mean, that was a guy that because we made the difficult decision at the deadline last year, we were able to acquire him. And we have, at a minimum, six years of control over that player yeah. if he comes up and makes it to the major leagues. Now, he still has work to do. He still has things he has to do to get better. But those are the type of difficult decisions that we hope set us up to be that playoff contender, that World Series contender for a long time moving forward. So we're excited about guys like that. You mentioned the Canario, just unbelievable raw power. Sure. I'm um, kind of like a Nelson Velasquez last night. Absolutely. Um, you know, both of those guys are able to hit the ball really, really hard and really, really far. And we'll just keep adding those types of guys to our system, keep putting the resources in place, having deliberate plans for those guys to, to grow and work on the goals that are going to help them bridge the gap from where they are to where they want to be. And when you do that over and over and over again, you build up this core of players that we can then supplement yeah. outside, of, outside of the organization and win a bunch of baseball games. That's the idea. That's what we're working on every single day. And what about the young arms like a DJ Hers, a Jordan Wicks, to go along with the 16 of 20 arms that were selected in the most recent MLB amateur draft? I mean, when it comes to prospects, who could sling it? The Cubs, well, they're knocking them off a tree right now. Yeah, it's fun to, to think about Hers and Wicks specifically, as you mentioned. Yeah. Outside of being left-handed and pitchers, not much in common. You know, hers is it's a high strikeout. You know, command is something that he's working on right now, but that probably plays into some of his, mm -hmm. his, his success. Wicks came from college a little bit more uh, detailed, a little bit more able to, to control the ball over the plate, but also able to miss bats as well. You know, those are two guys that have kind of moved in lockstep up the system more recently, moving up from high A to double A, that we feel like both have chances of, of being long-term starting pitchers for us. Obviously, as we already talked about, there's 16 guys coming into the system right now that, good. that are arms that you know, are going to be able to work up through that. And then there's guys that you know, are in AA and AAA that are starting to matriculate up to the major leagues like your Yulmans and your Hughes's sure. um, that we're excited about. So, yeah, I mean, the, the process is in place. The machine is working. Um, it's just, you know, take some patience, and then that's something that – it's hard for all of us. It's certainly hard for us in the office. I can guarantee you that. Okay, we talked about uh, Pete Crow Armstrong, the number two prospect in the Cubs minor league system, but uh, how about the number one prospect in Brendan Davis? We know he went under the knife, had some back surgery, but he says he does want to return this season. Is, is that where you want him to be, returning from a, a back surgery? Because you know a guy with pop like that, sometimes those hinge points, uh, they can be tricky down the line. Yeah, I mean, obviously less than ideal than any time our guys have a surgery, okay. and, and, a, and a back surgery obviously less than ideal as well. The good part about Brennan's surgery is it wasn't a structural issue. We were afraid of that early on, and then we actually got in there um, and had the surgery, figured out that it wasn't, and it was something that uh, you know, was a little bit easier to recover from. We're hopeful that he gets in games in mid-August. Yeah. You know, we would love to get him back on the field just for that mental you know, kind of breather of like, hey, yeah, I'm, I'm back and I can have a, a normal off season. You know, we'll think about ways to get as many at-bats as we possibly can. It's funny, as we're going through the draft, you know, looking at Brennan's age and then comparing that to a lot of the guys in the draft sure. age, you know, Brennan's younger, right? So we're talking so about good. these. Yeah, so we're yeah. talking about these guys in the third, fourth, fifth round yeah. that are that are bats, and we're saying, well, this guy's a year older than Brennan or two years older than Brennan. Um, so it just reminds you that hey, like he's got a long path here uh, to both get to the major leagues and then a long time here with us once he's in the major leagues. Um, so still really encouraged by him. Just want to get him back on the field and, and get him playing again and. Hopefully that'll happen here soon in the next month. Yeah, all in due time when it comes to Brendan Davis, Pete Crow, Armstrong, and the list goes on when it comes to all these prospects. Now, Carter, you being in your first year as general manager of the Chicago Cubs, there have to be some growing pains, some lessons learned. Is there anything that comes to mind in particular when you have to navigate some of these waters of being a general manager of one of the most popular sporting franchises in all the world? I, mean, I think the fun part is, is the guy that had my job before, you know, is 30 feet to the left of okay, me. Yeah. Um, so anytime that there's, you know, struggles or things that we're working through, um, you know, I have a, a great ear right there. And then, you know, my other contacts in the game and then having a wife back home that, mm -hmm. that's so supportive is really helpful. But, you know, it's hard. It's the most fun job in the world, but it's hard as well. I mean, we understand how much the Chicago fans around the world care about the Cubs. I talked about in my press conference Back in October, it feels like a couple days ago, but I guess it was about eight months now, mm -hmm. just seeing the reaction of the Cubs fans when they won a World Series game. Not the World Series, just a World Series yeah. game. And so knowing how hard it is you know, when we're not winning, when we're not in the position that we want to be in. Now, the hardest place for that is on the bench. That's Rossi and those okay. guys. It's the hardest for them in the world. It's almost as hard for us. And so I think that aspect of things is – not a surprise necessarily, but it's one that's really hit home of just, hey, like people care about this yeah. and we have a responsibility to work every second of every day to try to put the best winning club on the, on the field that we can. And so that's what I would say is just 
realizing how much of a responsibility that is and doing everything we can to make that happen for the people of Chicago and the guys on the field. And, you know, that's what we'll do. You know, David Ross, he's a winner, signed a contract extension right before the season got underway. There's been ups and downs so far in his tenure as a Cubs skipper. But when you look at 2022 as a whole, how good of a job has David Ross done? Really good. I mean, you know, you give Casey Stingle a roster that, you know, has a bunch of guys get hurt. It's going to yeah. be really difficult for sure. him. You know, so, you know, I think same for Rossi, right? Like, he's had a, a odd entry into professional baseball. You know, mm -hmm. his first year was 2020, which was the most insane year of anyone's Absolutely. life. And I can tell you on the baseball side, there was nothing normal about that. And then 2021, there's an odd spring training and odd entry onto that. And then 2022, there's this whole lockout situation that, that threw a wrench into everything. So there really hasn't been anything normal to Rossi's entrance so far. The best part about Rossi, um, amongst a lot of things, is just his desire to learn and to grow. Mm -hmm. You know, I think we all make mistakes every single day. Me and Jed probably more than anyone, I'm, I'm sure. But Rossi, after every game, we go over the things that he's learning and the things that he's growing from. And it's unbelievable just to see that mindset of like, hey, how can I get better every single day, no matter if it's a, a 10 run win or a 10 run loss. Um, and so I think you put that together along with just his ability to connect with people, and there's a lot of encouraging things there. Yeah, and you touched on the fact that if you give Casey Stengel a roster that has been decimated by injury, he'd have a tough time going out there and winning ball games too when you see all the injuries that have stacked up over the season. Nico runs into an umpire. Seiya Suzuki, he hurts his ring finger. Cody Hoyer goes down with Tommy John surgery. How frustrating have all those injuries been every turn of the corner? They're frustrating, yeah. you know, but I think it's you get you get 10 seconds of, all right, that's frustrating, then you get... Let's move on. Let's move on, and hey, how can we prevent these things from okay. happening? Some of them, how can we prevent Nico from running into an umpire? Probably not going to figure that sure. one out, right? But thinking about, okay, what can we do with our arm care programs? What can we do with our throwing programs? How can we think about acquiring players that have better health histories? How can we tweak anything that we can within mm -hmm. our systems to try to keep guys as healthy as possible? Now, I don't think that we're actually looking to be to never have guys get hurt, I think that would mean that we weren't actually pushing guys you know, to their limits, but figuring out what's the optimal way to, to move forward so that we don't have these situations going forward is something that we're working on constantly and you know, really the only thing that you can do when those things happen. Yeah, absolutely. Now, one thing that we've seen happen a lot this season, the Cubs getting off, scoring first, but holding leads, that's been the biggest problem. And the Cubs, they've been in a lot of close ball games, one-run games, two-run games. And Rossi, just a few days ago, he said that this Cubs team right now they need to learn how to win ball games. How does this young squad, a squad that has been decimated by injury, as we just touched on, how do they learn to win ball games, Carter? Yeah, I think you know you're kind of hitting on some of our situational struggles. Sure. You know, our runners in scoring position hitting, our runners in scoring position pitching. You know, just in terms of shutdown innings in those situations, and, and that's something that has to be learned. You now, I think the sabermetricians of the world might say, "Hey, all of that's luck, and it's just sample size, and teams will regress to the mean." And, and certainly, there's there's luck involved. But there's also an approach just to understand, okay, what am I trying to do? What is the pitcher trying to do to me? If I have a runner on second and nobody out, is he gonna put a ball over the outside part of the plate so I can go the other way? It's like, no, he's gonna go in on me. And so thinking about adjusting your approach that way and having those types of thoughts as a hitter, having those types of thoughts as a pitcher, and then just getting used to having those mm -hmm. situations to allow our players to play up to their potential, whether it's a high lever situation or a low lever situation. That's something that Rossi and his experiences yeah. and our coaching staff are really good at and understand, but it's a process in teaching our guys and it's things that you know we're going over every single day with them. Yeah, not to harp on the injury bug, but having a guy like Nick Madrigal healthy in situations when you go to extras with that ghost runner on second, he would certainly be a feather in the cap as well as a player like Jason Hayward. We know those guys currently banged up. So what does the future hold for that pair right now? Yeah, so Nick just had his uh, just started his rehab assignment mm -hmm. once again last night in Iowa. Had a couple of knocks, so that was great That's to good. see. Yeah, so I mean, we'll we'll make sure that he's healthy before we you know have any other decisions off of that. But mm -hmm. just getting him healthy, we're excited. You talk about just his ability to make great contact. You know, he showed that in 2020 with the White Sox. Obviously, miss most of the year in 2021 with the hamstring injury. Haven't really gotten full Nick Madrigal up to this yeah. point in 2022, but know that he's itching to have that happen and is working really hard to get his body back in, in a place where he's able to play every day and also get a swing in a place where he's able to be the player that he knows he can be. Jason obviously dealing with some, with some knee injuries. Don't have a timeline at the moment for him. 
Um, but, you know, somebody that obviously is such a huge part of this franchise, yes. you know, has had so many major moments, such a leader in our clubhouse, and, you know, just so thankful that he's around and, and, and part of this team, regardless of the role. Yeah, Dyersville, Iowa, feel the dreams game right around the corner. Do you have your hotel reservations booked? <laughs> Luckily, we'll be on the plane <laughs> in and out. I'm not sure that the oh. Super 8 in Dyersville can okay. hold all of us, right? Um, but I'm really excited about that. I'm going to bring my dad out there. Nice. Um, my mom and my, my wife are going to come as well. But just be able to share that type of moment is, is really cool. And, you know, watching that game on TV and last year, I was thinking, man, that would be so awesome to be able to experience that. And then for that to happen, you know, a year later, I'm, I'm pretty pumped. Carter, the day you were named general manager of the Chicago Cubs, I'm sure you envision yourself hoisting one of those commissioner's trophies. Is, is that the end goal? Is that the end game right now for the Chicago Cubs franchise and you, Carter Hawkins? It absolutely is for, for the franchise. And, and I'll say something that probably is a little bit corny here, but like when you think about like what is, what is that vision, right? It's not that one person holding, holding the trophy. It, I experienced the American League championship, but it was being with the 20 guys in the clubhouse that you worked so hard over such a long period of time, having a beer and talking about all the moments that led to that moment. Like that was the moment that really encapsulated just the things that get us really excited and what we do. Um, and that's absolutely something that we want to do here with the Cubs, and we want to do it a lot. We want to do it over and over again, which means being disciplined, having a great process, doing things that sound boring on the surface, but put you in a place to have long-term success in the future, and that's what we're really excited about doing. Yeah, for the Chicagoans and Cubs fans and know who know what winning looks like in 2016, we saw a slight glimpse of that the weekend that the Cubs hosted the Boston Red Sox. And to see the Cubs in this situation record-wise, but to see the stands full, fans cheering from top to bottom, that has to be an encouraging sight. Oh, yeah, it's super fun. But just walking in here and just understanding how supportive the, the Cubs fans are of the club, you know, regardless of the situation. Mm -hmm. The energy in the ballpark, I mean, it's it's pretty special. My friends coming in, you know, from Cleveland or from Atlanta where I grew up and, and seeing just how you know, the experience of going to a Cubs game, uh, it's pretty special and, and something that we certainly uh, don't take for granted. Yeah, 15 runs in game one of the second half of the season. Record aside, oh, what are you looking to see out of this Cubs ball club in the second half, Carter? Yeah, I think continuing to, to improve our approach offensively and from the pitching side. We can continue development of some of our young players, getting them those reps at the major league level. A guy like Nelson Velasquez, seeing him get those opportunities at the major league side, it's worth its weight in gold. Um, so that's something that I'm really, really excited about. And just continuing to refine our process at the major league level. I think, you know, just thinking about how are we game planning? How are we distributing our lineups? How are we helping guys get better every single day? Like, we got a whole half of a season to make sure that we're getting those better every single day. So we put ourselves in a really, really good position for 2023. And when it comes to looking towards 2023, getting guys like Christopher Morrell, Nelson Velasquez in there on an everyday basis, is that a point of emphasis right now? I think certainly it's easy just to put Morrell in the lineup because he's the best <laughs> option, Anywhere. right? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, getting him those, those opportunities, getting the opportunities in the infield has been great. Getting the opportunities in center field has been great. You know, you think about a lineup in 2023 and on, and you think about, okay, I want Christopher Morrell in there, yeah. but how nice is it to be able to say, hey, you can play all these different positions. Mm -hmm. I think about, you know, not to compare players, but Jose Ramirez was a similar type player in Cleveland sure. from a standpoint of he could play multiple positions. Now he's entrenched himself at third base, but he started in left field, played mm -hmm. some short, played some second. That just gave him opportunities to get major league at bats. Same thing for Chris, and it'll also give us opportunities to put players in around him. Um, so, you know, what a great piece to have. And, you know, absolutely excited about having him in the organization. Absolutely. Like Christopher Morrell, flexibility is key, and that's exactly what Carter Hawkins has been able to do in his first season as the general manager of the Chicago Cubs. Carter, thanks so much for taking time out. We really appreciate it. We know your schedule, it's a tight one. So thanks to you and all the fans out there. I'm sure they thank you as well. Appreciate it. Well, thanks, Cole. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Pleasure is all ours.